Thank you, Simeon. <clears throat> My exercise tonight is to read from the book of Proverbs. So if you'd like to turn the your Bibles to chapter one and verse number one. That's where we'll start to read, and we'll read a few verses <clears throat> there together and see if we can glean some precious truth <clears throat> from it. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. <clears throat> to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb, and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. <clears throat> the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Now turn over the page to chapter 2, and we'll read a few verses at the beginning of this chapter 2, uh, chapter as well. <clears throat> In chapter 2, verse number 1. My son. If thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasure, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth, cometh knowledge and understanding. And we just trust the Lord will bless the reading of the word of God. And, and as we seek to draw some thoughts from it, that it will indeed be a help to us each and every one. And Proverbs, book of Proverbs is one of the poetical books of the Old Testament. There are five of them, <clears throat> Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Proverbs is the middle book of those five. Either side of those five, you have on the previous books, five Pentateuch and 12 histories. On the other side, Solomon. You have five major prophets and 12 minor prophets. <clears throat> the Proverbs, well, the definition, it's obviously a saying. It's obviously something that's to the point. It comes from the root word of the rule <clears throat> or to compare. So, <clears throat> Proverbs can be described as rules for living. But anyway, we're going to look at some of them and see if we can't get a blessing for, for considering them. <clears throat> the book of Proverbs, I think you've probably noticed already from the reading that each verse seems to consist of a couple of phrases. <laughs> and it's just, inter I'm just going to uh, give a few tips about that, that um, factor. Some of the verses could be two lines which contradict each other. 
And I can illustrate that by turning to, I'm not going to turn to it, I'll quote it. Uh, chapter 26, when it says, <clears throat> Answer not a fool according to his folly, because you're going to come like him. And then verse number five says, Well, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be lifted up and can see. And one says, not do it. And the other one says, do it. So that we know there's no contradiction in the word of God. <clears throat> so the proverb taken together could be described as saying something unfitting, not appropriate. <clears throat> the second one could be, it would be a fitting one. So if you don't do it, you won't fall into the trap of becoming like a fool. If you do do it, well, there might be some hope that he might learn from what you do. And instead of being filled with conceit of his own wisdom, he learns from what you've said to him. <clears throat> there's, an, there's another three series of parallelisms too, things running side by side. Sometimes you get <clears throat> the two phrases that are synonymous, the, the same. They're linked generally by the word and. And if you have a look at verse number five of chapter one that we've read, here's an illustration of it. A wise man will hear and increase in knowledge or learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise councils so it's it's the same but it's it's restated a slightly different way and that's obviously to bring out a greater depth of meaning in verse number nine you've got another example of parallelism synthetic the same <clears throat> and in this case they shall be an ornament of grace to thy head and a chain about thy neck <clears throat> these are two similar ones but this time it's building up it's adding to the first the second one is adding to the first one so that's helpful you get a, again you get a rounder um, view of the of the point that's being made when you come back to verse number seven you've got an antithetical one opposite and what does that say? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So you've got those who listen and those who don't listen. So we're not going to we're not going to go through every verse and pick out all the parallelisms, but I just mentioned that so that uh, it may help you when you're reading Proverbs to realise that that's the case and perhaps derive greater benefit as you read the proverb <clears throat> now the there's many st subjects in in the book of proverbs the, the verses don't seem to be always connected or follow a theme but uh, solomon was one who had three thousand proverbs and he's put 300 odd into this book of proverbs in the bible so we've got a fair selection of every situation. And it is amazing from if you read the, the Proverbs and some have suggested, well, it's a good book to read in a month because you can have a chapter every month and you know which day of the week it is because you're gonna read chapter one today and chapter two tomorrow and that'll correspond with day one and day two and so on. <clears throat> it's not something slavishly needs to be adhered to uh, but that's one way you can um, keep up with it. And it does give you uh, every day some little uh, proverb, some little instruction that can help you. And uh, we found that the other day when something came up and, uh, and I suddenly remembered, well, that's just exactly the proverb I read this morning. So it is very helpful that way. It speaks of many things, sons, fathers, mothers, wise, simple, fools, 
strange women, slothful, sluggard, scorners, all those we come across, speaks of a savior, Jehovah. Jehovah is mentioned, I think, about a hundred times in, in, the, in, this, in this book. Savior, sovereign, creator, judge, observer, defender. Yes, and, that, and more. So what's the theme of the book? How to live godly and righteously. And that's what we're going to try and draw some lessons from so that we might be able to do that. Coming to verse 1 of chapter 1, we read that the, the Proverbs of Solomon. Now, we know he was the king after David. His kingdom was the most glorious of kingdoms. David was a greater king. And Solomon, alas, he the son of David. He would have learnt much from his father. When he became king, he was given great wisdom, so he understood things a lot better than you and I do. But he was flawed. And part of the problem with the flaw was that he had a multitude of wives and horses, which God has said it was not to be. <clears throat> His wife was Nama, and it's interesting the two references to his wife. She is an Ammonite, and perhaps that's where the problems began in the family, and not from the people of God. He had a son, and one in particular, Rehoboam, that followed him, and he was a foolish son. Where did he learn that from? He learned it from his father. <clears throat> In other words, Solomon didn't always stick to the wisdom that he imparted and that God gave him to impart and record in the book of Proverbs. The first six verses are a section of all verses. Um, <clears throat> two to six or a section, and I'm going to hit a, it's the need for resolve. Let's look at verse number two. To know wisdom. Now, the knowing can be of two ways. I can know as a fact, or I can know it by experience and, being put it, and putting it into practice. It's not just a head knowledge, it's become more of a heart understanding and knowledge. Wisdom <clears throat> there are three words that that um, uh, associated. There's knowledge, understanding and wisdom. And one of the things <clears throat> you can look at is What's the difference? They're similar, but what's the difference between them? <clears throat> you can have the knowledge of the Word of God. Uh, uh, knowledge of the Word of God, yes, I learned that because I had the privilege of being brought up in a Christian home and I learned it from a very young age. I could quote verses and such like. As I grew older, especially after I got saved, I began to get a little un more understanding of what I was learning and reading. <clears throat> I knew that I had to love God, but then when I got a little more understanding, I, I learned that God loves everyone. I had to love everyone. everyone. And there were sp certain relationships that involved love that I had to get an understanding of. But then wisdom, <clears throat> when do I show the love? In what circumstances do I demonstrate that love? That requires wisdom because I learn further as I keep reading the scriptures. I've got to love my enemies. And that needs wisdom because you can fall headlong as, as um, 
some of those that uh, Solomon mentions fall headlong into trouble. So wisdom is the highest one. To know what is the right thing to do at the right time in the right way. And that's what God would want us to do. As humans, we make mistakes, but God's not trying to make us make mistakes. We're human, but he wants us to pursue a path that's pleasing to him, a way that's right as far as he is concerned. It's not only that, it's wisdom and instruction. Instruction is got the idea of, of um, self-discipline. If you're approaching the word of God, you've got to be self-disciplined to be able to concentrate on it, to be able to understand it, and to, and to get the wisdom to go the right way. What we suggest, not, we're not suggesting that you need a high education, we're not uh, suggesting you, you need special training to be able to do this. The word of God is open to every believer. And I know that when you read the book of Revelation, uh, it says right at the very start of it, to, that God has given it so you can read it and understand it. Well, that's what we need. You need to understand the word of God. So this verse is giving acknowledgement of what it is and what is required to be able to obtain wisdom, which is another name for this book, wisdom's book. And then we've got to be able to perceive, pay attention to, the words of understanding. We don't just pick on a word. The scripture is full of words. Whose words are they? God's words. Not mine. Not my opinions. They're God's words. And that's why we've got to pay attention to them. <clears throat> to understand them. To have the discernment. And to judge between things. And to illustrate that, you know that people get a bit confused over the coming of the Lord, the second coming of the Lord, and don't understand there's two parts to it. <clears throat> That's what you've got to be, be able to do when you read the word of God. Read and understand that similar sounding things may not be exactly the same. And you need to be able to appreciate what the difference or discern what the difference is between them. <clears throat> come down to verse number three uh, how are we going to accommodate this two <clears throat> I should have said that there's four twos here uh, starting four verses uh, and it seems it's like they're like goals um, that we've got to aim for well, we've got to be able to accommodate this. To receive. Why do you receive? You want to receive it willingly, don't you? You want to receive it joyfully. <clears throat> Doesn't the psalmist say, thy word is my delight? That's what we read the word of God for, to get a wonderful delight from it. Instruction. Again mentioned this time. It's got more to do with the understanding or the comprehension of what we're reading. Justice. It's got the idea of right or uh, yeah, uh, what is right. Judgment is the decision that's to be made right. Equity. That's got to do with being even, even-handed. So we don't get biased in our understanding of the word of God. We get an even understanding. That's not to say that people have 
specialty, sh shall we say, for one of a better word. They have a favorite series of verses or a favorite line of study. We need that. <clears throat> but don't despise, don't set aside the rest of the book. <clears throat> we should learn by reading from cover to cover and get an even understanding of the word of God and to appreciate the author is a God who does not change. A God who wants the very best for us. <clears throat> so that's how to accommodate the truth. Come down to verse number four. <clears throat> to give subtlety to the simple. <clears throat> now, subtlety has, has got a bad connotation, crafty in a bad way. You just think of the, the devil when he was tempting Eve in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. He was more cunning than any other, crafty, cunning, subtle. subtle. But then <clears throat> when God had the tabernacle and the temple to be built. He said to Moses <clears throat> in the first place that he wanted though the, the ones that God had chosen were able to work in cunning work, cunning in their work with silver and gold and such like. When the temple was to be built, <clears throat> Solomon wanted Hurim, the king was uh, was he of Assyria to provide not only cedars and such for the of Lebanon, but also to provide skilled and cunning craftsmen that could work gold and silver and stones and things. So that's the sort of craft or subtlety that God wants us to have to be workmanlike and to be good workmen, skilled workmen that can handle more than one thing. <clears throat> we don't try and be a workman that can do everything. <clears throat> God gives us skills and abilities, both natural and spiritual, and we should accept what God has given us and seek to prove to be workmen in that particular uh, sphere that God has placed us. It's subtlety that's a simple. Now, simple is not a um, clueless person. A simple uh, person in, the, in this context is one who is a learner. God wants us to be learners. He doesn't want us to reach the stage, however old we are, and say, well, we've got it all. No, he wants us to be teachable so that we will be able to learn. <clears throat> Nathaniel, or Nathaniel rather, um, in John, he was noted as a man without God. That's a simple man. And you and I need to be without guile as well, as well, so that we can learn. The young and the old, it doesn't matter. The young, obviously, when we're growing up, and we're thinking uh, more of <coughs> uh, other things, but it matters not. We've got to be able to think and meditate upon the scriptures. We can <clears throat> we, 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 we can be uh, interested in other aspects of life, and we need to be as we grow. But when we grow, we need to go from milk to meat. 
we need to be able to build on and be strengthened by the power of his might in the things of God. <clears throat> we not only to have the young man to have this knowledge, and sometimes he's thinking of the knowledge of this world, and that's right and proper. We need to get knowledge to, to, to develop skills, to go about our daily lives. But this is what's talk, what he's talking about here is the skill and the beginning to learn of the things of God, the way God does things, not the way we. And so when you approach the scriptures, you don't approach it like it, as if you were going to a polytech or a university and sitting down at a desk and listening to a lecturer. Uh, that fills your head with knowledge, maybe. But God is aiming higher. He wants us to have wisdom. He wants us to have uh, a life that's lived pleasing to himself. You've got to use discretion. In other words, you're going to give careful consideration to what you're reading. Give a careful consideration to the meaning and the message, that, the point that God is trying to give you, to guide you in the things of God. <clears throat> so, you might be simple. And you might be guileless, and the world may mock at that. But it's useful in the things of God to be able to be taught and to give careful consideration. Verse 5, it hasn't got a 2 at the start of it, um, but he talks about the ambition. A wise man will hear. Now, again, this hearing is to increase learning. It's the hearing to increase in grace. <laughs> it's the hearing so that we can uh, put it down and put it into practice. It's not just to hear and say, yes, I've heard it. No, no, no. The hearing has got to go right down to the heart, the message that we're reading. And that's how we hear the word of God or should hear the word of God. <clears throat> The more we hear and the more we do, God wants us to grow. When we were young, we didn't hear or understand so much and didn't pay so much attention and were able to do. But the, as we grew, we were able to do that better. And God says, in my school, in my way of life, that's what I require you to hear and to be careful. And the hearing will develop growth. We're told in the New Testament to grow in grace and in the knowledge of him. We know from Peter, 2 Peter 4, um, chapter 1, there's eight things that we've got to add together. And what's the purpose of it? Learning them. Is that we might be fruitful and not barren. That's what God wants us to hear in a way that will make us fruitful and not leave us barren. This is what the word of God is for. It's not only <clears throat> in reading the Proverbs, it's reading the whole book. The same principles apply. God wants us to grow and be fruitful. We've got to have that ambition, the right ambition. <clears throat> so that we can come to a full knowledge of him, the one who has redeemed us. An illustration of that was Apollos. Remember, he only knew certain things, and Aquila and Priscilla were able to teach him. He was able to hear and to do. Uh, that's the sort of hearing that is required in each one of us. And because none of us holds the whole truth, None of us understands everything, and it's wonderful to have fellowship with fellow believers and to be able to discuss the word of God and thus to hear and to do and to grow <clears throat> and then to attain to wise 
councils. <clears throat> councils guidance. In Philippians 3 and 14, we get the expression that, he, that the apostles strive press down to, to press down toward the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. The attaining God's standard, God attaining the knowledge of him. That's what God wants us to do. And it's not something that you just get uh, that is casual. You've got to apply yourself to be able to attain. That's true in any examination on earth or test on earth. <clears throat> when you're young, you study to attain qualifications or skills. It just doesn't come automatically. You've got to put time and effort into it. And that's what this book requires, to put time and effort to be able to have that ambition to obtain. And then in verse number six, another two, to understand a proverb, <clears throat> to get that uh, that rule, to get that uh, instruction fixed into our understanding. It's a great goal to have to understand the proverb because sometimes proverbs are difficult to understand in particular. <clears throat> and the interpretation thereof. Now, interpretation of any scripture, we have to be careful. We need to read carefully and wisely and give proper consideration to so that we will get a balanced answer and more than that we'll get the right answer what god intended to say through that verse <clears throat> and we know that things can be taken out of context and and that some verses in a more whimsical way perhaps can be applied to a situation that is helpful um, based upon the word of god it requires application you just don't get the solving of a dark saying or a riddle, as it seems. But how do we get that interpretation? <clears throat> we get it because Psalm 36 and 4 says, In thy light shall we see light. So you can do it by comparing scripture. 1 Corinthians 2 and 13 talks about the spirit that helps us comparing spiritual with spiritual. Yes, it will require interpretation, often does require comparison of verses or references. Um, and again, the coming of the Lord is one of them. Salvation's another one because we know salvation is past, present and future. And you've got to be able to work out which one it is. Um, so that you get the correct understanding. So there's the things that we need to resolve to do if we want to gain wisdom. Now, the next section from 7 to 10, there's three different relationships or four different, um, one, two, three, one, th three relationships that are brought before us where this wisdom is required. Verse number seven, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It's the basis. It's that which is prime, that which is important, that we need to understand. Now, this relationship is with God, the wisdom that's associated with God, the fear of God, Fear, fear, and this thing is not scary fear. You're scared of something. This is reverential awe and fear that I understand <clears throat> who God is. 
what he has done. This world's religion can't give me that. God can. The fear of God in the Old Testament has got the same thought and understanding as godliness, the word mentioned quite a number of times in the pastoral epistles, godliness. How to give God his due. To give, how to give God his honor. To live a life that is pleasing to God. Now, the best example of that, of course, is the Lord himself. He ever delighted and pleased to do his father's will. <clears throat> it's wonderful to see and know. <clears throat> when you look at the book of Proverbs, you can compare it to, say, the book of James. James was written by the Lord's brother. And some of the uh, features, commendable features there that we're required to adopt. Where did he get those from? He lived in the same house as the Lord. He saw a life that was lived perfectly sinlessly right from day one. And that's what he wrote. So when you read the book of James, just remember that. James is writing about one that he knew the son of God, the one who lived a perfect life. That's godliness in its truest sense. And that's what God wants us to do, to live a life pleasing to him that is totally for him. So <clears throat> this is the beginning, the origin the words of the wise and their dark sayings. <clears throat> the wise, of course, uh, those who, well, we know that from the wise man and the foolish man in the, in the gospels. The wise man built upon the rock and the foolish man built upon the sand. The wise man seeks after the wisdom of God. A fool, what does he seek after? He seeks after himself. He, he seeks after promoting self. In wisdom, you're looking to know God. The fool is looking to say, in O oh God, know God. In Psalm 14, you re read the phrase, the, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. There is is, is an italic, so it could read, the fool has said no God. An atheist believes there is a God. He's got the evidence all around him. He can't help but believe that. But what he does say, no God, no God for me. Why? Because I'm going to do what I want. I'm not going to have a God that I'm accountable to. I'm going to leave God completely out of my thinking and, and my actions. I'm going to focus on me. That's a fool. <clears throat> and so we can see that they despise, they set at naught. They reject the word of God and they reject God. Saul was an example of one who rejected the word of God. And so God said, I've rejected you from being king. <clears throat> the saviour. When he was upon the cross, he was despised by men. He was rejected of men. That's all they thought of him. What fools they were. To despise the very prince of life and glory that had come to provide salvation. It's so important that we do not despise the word of God. And then verse number eight my son hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother in family situations <clears throat> authority is where we first learn authority where we first learn submission 
Don't we need to do that when we come to the word of God, accept its authority and be submissive to it and not replace the plain teaching of scripture but with our own opinion? We need to be able to <clears throat> honor the God who has delivered us. In the parent in the family situation, you get headship, you get partnership, you get stewardship. That's what we get from the word of God when we submit to it. And then to honor uh, the head with ornaments and the neck with chains. That's to bring honor to the submission, bring honor to God. <clears throat> Just remember that a fool is one who has a stiff neck. He doesn't have a neck that's decorated with honor. Rehoboam was one who had a stiff neck. He despised the advice of those who knew, the elders that knew what the truth was and the right thing to do. He went for his young men. <clears throat> what a fool he turned out to be. He lost 10 twelfths of his kingdom as a result of his folly and his stiff neck. The third group that we want to draw attention to is my son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Sinners. This is where we have a choice. Do we follow the way of truth and life? <clears throat> the fruit of the spirit or the works of the flesh? And is it in Galatians? We've got to make a choice. Which way will we go? Which choice will we have? so that we don't get drawn in because there will be enticements. Joseph found it in Potiphar's house. He found it in the garden. What was Eve's problem? She just, dis she despised the word of God. She'd have produced that. She wouldn't have had the, the fall that she had. Yes. <clears throat> Peer pressure comes from sinners, our peers. What's our relationship to them? We've got to be careful that when we're young and we're growing up, we're trying to sort out who we are and where we want to be when we grow up. We're just trying to sort out uh, our independence so we can stand in our own two feet. We start to sort ourselves out so we can declare boldly what we believe or don't believe or what we're going to adhere to. <clears throat> but that's not the way. Don't be enticed along that line, especially today in certain teachings that are been promoted by the law and in schools and right down to that level to primary students. The things that they're faced with, <clears throat> it's terrible to consider. We've got to be careful that we don't become like the Jews under Saul, the, the, the Israel under Saul. They wanted a king to be like the nations. They were enticed. We're not to be like the nations. We're not to be like the world. And the world, as we've often said, can be summed up in the, as a mnemonic. The world and its ways, its organizations, its religion, its language, and its dress. Yes, the world is should not be a companion. You get that in Psalm number one. Isn't it? You don't walk, you don't walk and stand and sit with sinners, scorners, and the ungodly. No, don't be enticed by them, no matter how. Balaam learnt that lesson, even though he was not an honourable man, God told him that he wasn't to accept. Gehazi was one, another one who was enticed. 
when he knew it to be wrong. <clears throat> Here's a little thought for you. <clears throat> In Deuteronomy 26 and 9, God said he was going to bring them into a land of milk flowing with milk and honey. There could not have been a better land. When Hezekiah had a visit in 1 Kings 18 from Rabshakeh, an official from a Syrian court, he wanted to take over uh, Israel, uh, Israel. He wanted to capture the city. <clears throat> what did he say? He said, come with me. Come with me. God said, I'll bring. Into a land like yours. That has got corn and wine and olive oil. All things that require a lot of work. <laughs> Milk and honey is produced by the cow and by the bee. Not by human effort. There was an enticement that Hezekiah was wise enough to <clears throat> direct the nation not to accept. And come over to chapter two. I want to just mention a few things here too before we finish. We've had the resolve. We've had a, the resolve we need. We've had uh, the relationships. Now we're going to look at the rewards. The rewards of obtaining this wisdom. The promise of obtaining. Verse number one of chapter two. My son. Yes, it's directed uh, uh, to him personally. If, and three times the writer says, if, if you will. We've got to be receptive to the instruction of the word of God. <clears throat> What did the Savior say? Not my will, but thine. Be done. If thou wilt. Uh, have we set it as our priority? To put him first. Receive my words. God's words, not man's words, my words. <clears throat> Hide my commandment with the hide. Where do we hide it? In our heads? The Jew was told, the, uh, the Israelite was told to put it on the hem of his garment and hang it on his doorpost. <coughs> where have where, where we got to hide it? The truth of God in our hearts. It's God's communication to us. <coughs> We've got to be receptive that it is God's communication and accept it as such. And it'll govern the actions that we do. Verse number two. What does he say? Incline thine ear, bend it. <clears throat> In the Maori language, <clears throat> when you call somebody, you say, Hi, am I? You say, Kia Terry. That means do it quick. And it says, kia nawari. Nawari is a word that comes from the flax. And when the wind blows, it just gently bends. It doesn't break, it just gently bends. That's what the word incline means. Bend your ear to the word of God. Pay attention so you'll get it. You'll get the message. You'll get the understanding and then and apply it to thine heart. Yes, it's got to have application. There's no point reading the word of God if it doesn't, we don't apply. We've got to be responsive, in other words. Not only receptive, we've got to be responsive. Verse number three, <clears throat> we've got to cry and lift up our voice. How do we do that? We do that in prayer, don't we? We've got to be intensive about the word of God. It's not we approach something we approach casually. 
cream across the top. Read a chapter in five minutes and not remember a thing. I know we're busy lives. And especially when you've retired, you, you've got less excuse than you ever had before to sit down and take a little time to read the word of God and put a bit of intensive effort into understanding and, and obtaining this knowledge. Verse number four. If thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as treasure. <clears throat> silver. This is the worth of what you're looking at. It's compared to silver, which is worth something. Seek and ye shall find. You've got to be resolute for this. You've got to be earnest about this. And how do we express our earnestness in prayer, is it not? Seek and ye shall find. Yes, we pray to God. The Savior was the one that was most resolute when he cried to his father in the garden. The blood like sweat came from his brow. That was intensity. That was intensive. We've got to approach the word of God in the same way. Verse number five. Then, that, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord. Then the understand the fear of the Lord. Understand the godliness of Jehovah, who he is. He is the eternally existent one, existent one. He's the all sufficient one. He's the faithful God. He's the one that has illustrated for the joy that was set before. He endured the cross, despised the shame. Yes. The goal was ever before him. In John's gospel, he said several times, my hour has not yet come. But when he, he did say, my hour is now come. Yes, he never forgot that. That was that joy that drove him to that cross, to endure that for us, to bring us nigh to God. It was the delight. We delight in the word of God because of what it brings to, or who it brings us to, Jehovah, the faithful God, uh, faithful Lord. But then it's the knowledge of God, Elohim, the one that is clothed, the almighty one with majesty, greatness, and power. What did Isaiah see in chapter six? When the year that King Uzziah died, he saw the Lord lifted up high and exalted upon a throne. What did that do to him? It made him say, woe is me. Yes, the knowledge of the God brings to me a knowledge of myself. <clears throat> Verse number six. The Lord giveth wisdom out, out, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Here's the outcome. God give us from his hand. And mouth he gives it to us personally he gives us in a way that we can understand the mouth expresses words the living word has come and expressed the father to us yes when we read this book it's an, it's an expression of him to us personally so that we receive the personal message verse number seven he, the Lord, lays up sound wisdom for the righteous. <clears throat> He's the one that has reserved this truth for us. And yet it is accessible. We can obtain it now. We can seek and find now this precious truth that is laid up for us. <clears throat> the world would attack it. The world would corrupt it. But we've still got the living, pure word of God to be able to read and to build us up. He's our buckler. That's us. God protects his word, but he protects us as well. 
because he's our buckler, he's our shield. <clears throat> As the mountains are around Jerusalem, so is the Lord about, about those that fear him. When we're approaching this book, we've got one who surrounds us with his love, with his desires toward us, that we might become more like him in the way that we live these lives of ours. He keeps our paths. Floods to tsunamis and earthquakes, they shift paths and ways. <clears throat> we know that Psalm 119, 100, verse 105 says, <clears throat> a light unto my feet and a lamp unto my path. What's the difference between a light and a lamp? The light shows where my feet are, shines upon my feet so I can walk. I can see where my feet are going. A lamp, it shines further ahead. It shows the path ahead. Doesn't this, don't the scriptures do exactly the same? Same. Show me where my feet are. He preserves that path that I'm taking, that I'm seeking to follow him, not somebody else. Follow him and continue in that pathway. He continued in that pathway without deviation. And then he keepeth the path and he preserves the way of his saints. He preserves us to the goal. He preserves the treasure for us because we know we have an inheritance that fadeth not away. What a wonderful uh, blessing that brings us to. So just to briefly recap, let's see the example of Christ and how he was the daily delight of his father. Help us to put effort into obtaining this wisdom, knowing that blessings follow, blessings in Christ. Ephesians 1 tells us that. Heavenly blessings that are ours now. <clears throat> the fear of the Lord is the key. As he is, when we fear, we begin to appreciate as he is. That helps us to understand who we are. That leads us to humility. That when we see what we are, we understand better who he is. Then we worship. Because we've seen him as he is. He's worthy to be worshipped. And then we go on to be able to be useful to do for him. And do what he has planned. Do what he has enabled us to do. The last thought perhaps coming from 1 Peter chapter 2. We're holy priests, we're royal priests. To worship and to serve. Worship comes before service. May our hearts ever flow as we read the word of God out in true appreciation of him who has redeemed us. Thank you.